Hello, and welcome to today's ICTUS International Music Competition interview. I'm your host, Alex. Today we have a very special guest, Mary Elizabeth Bowden. Mary is a classical trumpeter and a gold medal Global Music Award winner. She's the founder of Seraph Brass, a quintet composed of America's top female brass performers and the Chrysalis Chamber Players. She's performed all over the world as a trumpet soloist and as principal trumpet with numerous symphony orchestras. Mary will serve as a trumpet judge in our inaugural 2018 trumpet competition. Mary, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. I, I wanted to start our interview today. We just gave a brief uh, snapshot of some of the many things you've done. But if you could just tell us maybe about the very first notes in music uh, you're, as a young child. Sure. Well, I, I picked the trumpet because my two older brothers played horn and trombone. And I have this very clear memory of opening up my Yamaha cornet when I got it in the mail the first day. And I just focused on making the best sound that I could that day. And that approach has helped me for the past 25 years. That's always my main focus. The first notes of the morning are making the best sound. Wow, so some serious <laughs> focus from an early age. Yes. Um, how old were you when you decided that you maybe wanted to go to college for music? Um, I think I was about 12 or 13. So I decided pretty early on. And so my, my school path was a little bit different. I skipped high school and I went to community college because I was able to choose my own schedule, which was much lighter than high school. So I had a lot of time to practice and to also work other jobs so I could buy other trumpets like the piccolo trumpet. Were you studying music at the community college or you were, you were just doing a degree there and then playing trumpet on the side or? Um, I got my associate's degree okay. at Juliet Junior College, okay. and then I played, practiced trumpet on the side and played in the Chicago Youth Symphony. And then from there, I was able to practice enough that I got into Curtis, where I studied with David Bilger, and then I continued on to Yale, where I studied with Alan Dean. Okay. And do you remember, I mean, Curtis is pretty competitive to get into as a student. Do you remember what that audition experience was like for you? Or? Yes, I do. I was the very first one of the day, and I was very nervous that I did not warm up. And my first piece I played was the Tomasi Concerto. Oh, wow. I don't know if I could do that now, but that's, that's what happened. And, and uh, what was your preparation like when you were going for that? Do you remember? Or? Well, I studied with a trumpeter in the Chicago area named Carrie Lee. And she demanded the highest standards from me. And she helped me prepare. I remember that I wanted to play an easier concerto, and she told me a year out, you are going to learn the Tomasi concerto. And I was a bit scared, but she always pushed me beyond my comfort zone and always made me play challenging works. And then Tomasi became one of my most favorite pieces that I always go back to. And so I'm really grateful that I had a teacher at a young age that always challenged me to play music that I, might, that I didn't think I was ready for, but it always made me better. And when you were at Curtis and Yale, do you have any uh, takeaway experiences or lessons that you, you learned there? Well, both David Bilger and Alan Dean focus on ease of playing and making a beautiful tone. And that is something that was very special to me and that I've carried, that I will carry for the rest of my life. And that's very, very valuable to me. And so when you, when you left Yale, what was your, your path? Like what, what was the first thing you, did you take auditions or what was your? Well, I thought at the time that the only way to make a living was to win an orchestral position. I always wanted to be a soloist when I was a teenager, but I was told that that was unrealistic and not possible. So having to pay for my own school, I decided to try to win an orchestral job, and I ended up in the Richmond Symphony. And, um, you know, I tried to do that and with many auditions, and it just didn't feel right just to play an orchestra every day. And it wasn't until I met Jens Lindemann at the Banff Center. Um, he really challenged me to pursue what my main goal was, which was to be a soloist. And so that summer, of 2010 was when I really started to um, play for as many soloists as possible. I went to Chosen Vale and I took lessons from Hokan Hardenberger and many players from around the world and um, just really, really tore my 
trumpet playing a part and tried to improve as quickly as possible. And that's, that's where everything started. I remember we, we met at Chosen Vale that summer and it's amazing to see where your career has gone in just seven years. It's absolutely incredible. I was wondering maybe if you could tell us a little bit more about the path that you took to becoming a soloist and forming your, your own chamber group and your, your own brass quintet. Sure. Well, I think the most important thing is to have the highest quality of playing and knowing that your playing is in a level that you are confident to present recitals and have endurance to play through a quintet show, things like that. Um, so that was my main focus. It still is. I play for many people and I always try to improve every day. And I think that's the number one thing. Before you make fancy videos or put yourself out there, making sure that your level of playing is always improving and you're always challenging yourself every day. And so that's, that's what I do and continue to do. And then um, after that, it's just uh, finding the tools to, to have a solo career. Um, at the Banff Center with Jens Lindemann, I made a demo CD of Telemann, Concerto, Syrinx, and Haydn. And that's where I met my, uh, my favorite engineer, Florian, who has made my professional CDs. And um, so I learned through that collaboration. Um, so the first step was to make a really high quality demo CD. And I sent that to various conductors and colleagues. And the importance of networking is so important. Even if you're not trying to be a soloist, it goes for any field of music that networking is probably the most important thing outside of your quality of playing. Uh, a lot of my concerts have come from conductors or colleagues that knew me as a teenager. And so making good impressions and just being a nice person is so, so important. And now that we have social media and um, the internet, it's even easier to stay in touch with so many different people. And so on top of that, you have this platform where you can share what you have. You can share your solo works. And when I decided to become a soloist, I was too old for most competitions. So I didn't have a way of becoming known. And the way I became known was by putting up my playing on YouTube. And that has gotten me many different positions and different orchestras. Even I don't pursue orchestra work that much, but since putting my solo recitals and uh, videos on YouTube, I've been offered different orchestral positions around the country. And so it's, it's just so great that we can now share what we can do with the world. On, on YouTube and Facebook, and that opened a lot of doors for me to be able to show what I can do. Mm -hmm. I remember, I, I think you did the YouTube symphony, correct? Yes, so, that yeah. was one of my very, very first videos that I did. Um, it's a little bit low quality video if you go look back now, because that was back in 2010 or 11. And so you can, if you go to my channel, you can really see the evolution of the videos that I've, that I've put up throughout the years. I put up a mixture of live performances, and also higher end videos, just to show a mix of um, professional versus um, just you know the, the the live honest footage. And I think we were talking a little bit maybe before we started, um, and it was great that you just talked about networking and creating connections. But I, I remember one of our other judges, Brandon, was telling me about this that in in the 21st century, it's not the same as having a manager and you just have a full career. Um, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that, just uh, how you, you just putting yourself out there and, and going for it. Sure. Well, I have two different managers working for me and the group, but um, they are just helping me book work. I do book most of the work on my own. So I do work as an administrator for both myself and for Serif Brass and for Chrysalis. And so I'm constantly networking and sending emails and making phone calls as well as fitting in the practicing. And so it's definitely more than a full-time job. And I was wondering if you could tell us just a little bit from that. So you're, you're maintaining this level of playing, which is amazing, and you have all these different groups and you're doing all of this administrative work. How do, you, how do you balance all of that? Like, do you have like a daily plan or I, I, what is, how do you have that, that balance? Well, I, I personally try to just do as much as I can every day, but it really is important to schedule time to be a human and to uh, 
just to have some downtime to, to relax. That's really important. And for me, having enough sleep is um, really important to do anything. I need to have the number of hours of sleep that I, that I like to have. And then I can pretty much work all day with little breaks. In addition to putting yourself out there, I know you've done a number of trumpet competitions as well. And I was wondering if you could tell us about the importance of those competitions and what you've, how they've either helped your career or what you've learned from them. Sure. Well, I actually didn't do very many competitions at all because I didn't pursue the solo path until my late 20s. So I was too old for most competitions. And I really wish I had because it really make, they really make you learn a ton of repertoire and you get to hear so many great players from around the world and really get inspired. Um, having said that, I did do a couple. I did the um, International Women's Brass Conference Trumpet Competition, and I won the, the first place in the trumpet competition in 2012. And also that summer, I was 30 years old, so I was at the age limit of, of Ellsworth Smith, which is one of the biggest trumpet competitions out there. So I made it to the live round. So that summer, I turned down all paid work, and I just decided to practice. And I worked really, really hard, but unfortunately, I was hit in the face not once, but twice. Oh, no. um, I was studying at the BAMP Center with Jens, and I lifted a music stand up, and it cut my lip open here. Um, and luckily, I, I healed pretty quickly from that. And I thought, my, I, at that point, I thought I was done, but I came back pretty quickly. And I remember I went back to Santa Fe, where my husband was, and I played some of the list for him that morning. And he said, This is the absolute best you've ever sounded. And then that night, I was walking to my car, and out of nowhere, someone threw a frisbee right here. Oh my goodness. And I still have nightmares waking up being hit. And I know a lot of players have had worse accidents, but I had worked so hard the entire summer, I had just overcome a, a, another traumatic injury. And so the way this one hit, the lip here, I knew that it was not good at all. Um, but I was very stubborn. I waited a couple of weeks, and then there was two weeks before the competition. Looking back, I should have dropped out. If you have an injury, the most important thing is to let yourself heal. But I was stubborn. I thought it was my last chance, and I went in and played with a bruised face. And um, I played as well as I could, but looking back on it, I was injured. There's only so much that you can do when, when you have such a bad injury. And so I ended up taking about a month off or so and then coming back very slowly and my face was completely different. And, I, and this is when I was, when I had just signed with the manager and um, I had my first concerto with a real orchestra on the books coming up. And so I was a little bit panicky and I'm like, I'm gonna figure this out. I, there's no other option but to figure this out. And I did. It, having the injury made me actually use these corners for the first time. I always got away with not warming up and being a natural player, but I always struggled with endurance. And so having the injury made me use these muscles. And now I feel like I don't really have endurance problems. I, um, I learned how to play Brandenburg the year after the injury. And um, I, I, I can just do things that I couldn't do before. But I think it's because I was forced to really take a close look at my fundamentals. And so I never let go of the fundamentals now. I do a lot of work um, in all the different ranges. I don't just pick up the trumpet and play something. I make sure that my fundamentals are really set for the day. And um, I practice everything very slowly. And um, so I really feel like I've become a lot stronger because of the injury. So I think that you can always take something that's very negative and work it to your advantage and make it positive. And so looking back on that traumatic experience, it really changed the way that I play the trumpet completely. And I'm not sure if I could play as well as I play now without having that experience that I had. Those are, the experiences are amazing to hear about. I, know I, I went through an injury myself where I split the lip on the stage and I kept playing on the split lip. Oh. And then I ended up having to take almost six months off and come back from nothing and it's, you learn so much about yourself, but that's, that's amazing to hear. Uh, and so you came back within a month from, from the injury. Pretty slowly, yes. Pretty I didn't slowly. try to play anything too difficult. And I just, um, and I still feel the injury every day. My lip gets a little bit more swollen here. 
Um, but I'm really careful. I always ice every night, ice and heat. Um, and it doesn't, as long, I'm aware of it, and I'm always aware that I'm always using these muscles correctly, and it's not a problem. So I think, I feel like the injury almost keeps me in check to make sure that I'm never just pressing here. I'm always using my air really well and playing in a healthy way, because the minute that I don't, this starts to get very swollen and doesn't vibrate. So I can okay. never get to that place. Okay. And so you said you developed a sort of a daily routine out of that. And what is your daily routine like? Is it well, I like to start with um, lip bends. And I heard this from Hokan Hardenberger at Chosenvale, um, really getting the gravel out of the sound. So I do really soft lip bends. Well, first I do some mouthpiece buzzing with a drone. And then I, um, then I do lip bend starting on mid G and I bend the note as far as I can. And I just concentrate on that mid to low range. And then I intersperse that with some higher um, air attack or poo attacks up high with a lip trill to make sure that I feel very, very flexible for the day. And I keep this all at a very, very soft dynamic so I don't um, blow out the aperture for the day. Um, and then from there, uh, depending on what I have, uh, it just really depends on what the repertoire is that day. If I have a concert, uh, I love doing a mixture of different Clark exercises, and I mainly focus on the low range. And I do slur four, double tongue four, and I try to make the double tonguing as seamless as the slur. And so I really focus a lot on the low range because in my shows and my repertoire, I tend to do more of the piccolo E flat playing. And so I really love to have the balance of working on a ton of low playing first thing in the morning. And every player is different. This does not, this would not work for everybody, of course. But for me, it really helps me stay balanced and keep the resonance in my tone. Um, because I play so high in a lot of the repertoire, it's really nice to have that balance of doing low basic work. And so that, that is like my tour routine. Since in the serif brass shows, I play a lot of the high, the, a lot of the high pieces. And um, so I, I really like to make sure that I'm having a balanced diet of trumpet playing throughout the day. So basically practicing the opposite of what I'm doing. So I wanted to touch a little bit more on, on your lip injury. We were just talking about that some and just more about, you spoke about the importance of getting sleep and resting. Um, do you feel, do you have any like specific times that you take rest on the trumpet or do you just keep practicing every single day? I don't take too many days off. Um, I like to play every day, but sometimes I do take one or two days off if I have the time, um, especially after a long period of touring, like a few months of touring, it's nice to get a couple of days off the face and then re restart. As far as practicing, I never practice until nothing comes out, you know what I mean? But um, I do do long, longer sessions. It depends on what I'm preparing for. Um, so every day is, is, is different depending on what I have coming up, but I definitely, I do different parts of the day. I don't try to do it all in one session. I definitely break it up into two or three different sessions throughout the day. Okay. And I wanted to move forward now to that, now that you're sitting on the other side of the panel at these competitions, you just did the Leixa International Trumpet Competition at the Leixa International Brass Week. What do you listen for? I think what I listen for is someone who really tells a story. And of course, all the basic things need to be in place too. Like, um, good intonation and ease of playing. I want to hear someone who I'm not thinking about if they can play the notes or not. It's like I'm not worried for them. I'm just relaxed and listening to that musician tell a story and make the most of the music. Okay. And uh, you're um, a resident artist now at North Carolina School of the Arts um, and you do master classes and some coaching. What are maybe some recurring things that you teach to students? or? I know it's, it's sort of individual, individual based, but maybe some of the bigger lessons. I think uh, ease of playing that I learned from David Bilger and uh, playing with a really, really great tone, being relaxed. And what I focus most on in master classes besides that is telling a story through the music and not being so caught up in all of the technical things, but focusing more on the phrasing and where you want dynamics to go or the peak of the phrase and getting into those elements of the music that are the fun parts, and then a lot of the technical parts will kind of fall into place instead of only focusing on the mechanics. And I wanted to ask too, when, when you're learning a new concerto or a new piece to perform, how do you go about that? I usually like to listen to a few different recordings 
and I start with very, very slow practice. I remember when I learned the Lieberman Concerto a couple of seasons ago, that was a new piece for me, and I just played it very, very slowly, and I felt like doing the slow work that, of course, we heard at Chosen Vale through Hokan Hardenberger, practice everything very slowly, so you're practicing success and really ingraining that into the fundamentals of that concerto. I think that's the most important thing for learning a new piece. I also like to sit and play the intervals on a piano and make sure that I can sing through the piece as well because if you just approximate things on the trumpet, I think that you're learning some bad habits. And so if you can sing everything in that piece and really, really get a clear concept in your mind of the sound that you want, and the phrasing, and you can actually hear the intervals and sing them, then you're gonna be able to play the trumpet a lot easier, and you're gonna be able to share that musical message that much stronger. Wonderful, wonderful advice. I need to do more of that for myself, <laughs> but that's something I tell all my young students. So you need to be able to sing it, and nobody wants to sing. <laughs> but, so when you're on stage as a soloist getting ready to play, what's going through your head? Like, as you're walking onto the or maybe you're, you're backstage and then moving to the stage? My mind is usually pretty quiet before a performance. And I think it's just having the experience of having played so many recitals, I've been able to quiet the noise that doesn't matter. Because there's one thing that I've learned, and it reminds me of a blog post that I just read by Tony Plogue. It was a story about um, one of his colleagues was warming up and they were doing a recording session. And to make small talk, Tony asked his friend, um, he asked, I think he asked him, so how do your chops feel today? And I think it was Ray Mace, he said, who cares? <laughs> and so that's pretty much what my mindset is. It's, it does not matter how it feels. You know, the trumpet may not feel great every day, and that's just the nature of our instrument. But if you really have a clear message about the music and you're really prepared, and you can sing those intervals in your head, and you've done all of the work that you've done, there's nothing to be scared of. And being nervous is also normal because if we weren't nervous, we wouldn't be human. And so I think if you just, if you embrace that and you go out and you know everything is going to be okay because you've done your work and no matter how bad your face feels, it does not matter. You're out there to share music with the audience. The audience wants to hear, they wanna hear great music. They don't really care about cracked notes or everything being perfect. Nobody wants perfect. They just wanna see you up there having a great time and sharing your music with them. So if you remember that the audience is on your side, it's so much easier to, to share music. I mean, I've, I've played concerts with um, chapped lips and not feeling great, migraines. And every time I go out on stage, if you just go, go towards that goal of making music, um, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter how you feel. The music often carries me through the show and oftentimes I'll forget, I'll forget that I'm sick or that I have a migraine. It'll hit me after the show, but during the show, getting into the zone of the music, that's, that's, where, that's the place that you wanna be. Wonderful. And what are some of your maybe highlights, um, the most memorable uh, experiences performing as a soloist or with your quintet? As a soloist, uh, making my first album, I was really proud of this album because it won a, an award through the Global Music Awards and I put everything together myself and did all of the planning. So that was a very big moment for me to, to accomplish that. And since then, Summit Records has signed on my group Serif Brass and we're releasing our first studio album in January. And I have another album in the works that I'm planning to record this this next summer through Summit Records also. So that was that's that was probably my biggest highlight. Other performances would be um, performing the Brandenburg Concerto for the next, for the first time because I also planned that concert through my group Chrysalis Chamber Players. I really wanted that piece to be in my repertoire, but I didn't want to wait for a group to hire me because I could be waiting forever. So I I planned it with my group, I learned how to play it, and I took a video of the performance, and since then I've performed many Brandenburg Concerto Number no. 2s. So it's learning how to, how to market myself in that way is, it has been very valuable. So I thought to myself, how can I book more concertos playing the Brandenburg Concerto? And I decided to make a video of my first concert that I performed with with my nonprofit group, Chrysalis Chamber Players and that resulted in getting booked with Brandenburgs every year. So 
thinking ahead and thinking strategically in that manner is a really great way to be an entrepreneur, not waiting for things to happen, but making them happen. Mm-hmm. So amazing. I wanted to maybe ask you a little bit more about the, the entrepreneurial experience and important of, importance of having those skills in the 21st century as a, as a musician, because obviously you've been very successful at first you, you play everything very well. And then you also have to do all the fundraising and the planning. Yes. Um, and the fundraising is not easy. That's always a, a difficult thing. And I know you, you just did an Indiegogo campaign mm-hmm. for your, the Serif um, CD. Could you just tell us a little bit more about some of the, the, maybe the tactics that you use and how you balance the, the practice for preparing the music and at the same time the sort of nonstop presence online that's needed to, sure. to promote that? Well, since I was uh, 14, 15, and when I started community college, I always worked another job that was not music because I needed to, because I needed money. And these jobs were always annoying to me at the time, and I had them all throughout college, all throughout my 20s, and I finally am doing everything that I want to do. I'm doing everything for my musical groups and my solo career, and I don't have to work any other jobs, which is great. And so reflecting on that, I ask myself, well, why am I able to run a group like Serif Brass? How am I able to figure out these things very quickly? And I think it's because I've had such a versatile experience doing customer service work and working in various offices for different companies that I've picked up on these skills that I didn't think would be useful. But now they're very useful because I'm able to do all of this administrative work. And a lot of these things, um, you know, I've never had a business class, so I'm learning a lot of things on the fly. I'm learning things as as I go, and I think if you listen to a lot of stories about people who do their own startups, most of their learning is done as they go along. And so just being a really quick learner and learning from your mistakes as quickly as possible, I think, is really valuable. And so I think it's important to, as a musician, to not just only be able to play the music, but if you have other skills and can multitask, I've really been able to use that as my advantage. Um, in the Richmond Symphony, when I was living there, right before I made the switch of, okay, I'm going to really try to pursue a solo career, I was working in the office part-time as an artistic administrator assistant. So I was communicating with artist managers, and so I saw a lot of materials come in from managers marketing their soloists and talking with me and trying to do that. And so I started to see how that process worked, and I learned so much from that because I learned what works and what doesn't, what doesn't work. So it's, it was really interesting for me to, to, to see that, and that's when I really started to learn how I was going to approach people in the field because I, I was able to see it firsthand in the office. Okay. And I wanted to talk to maybe a little bit, if you could tell us just a little bit about the resilience it takes to be a soloist. Because so we, we all see this amazing, we hear the amazing stuff and we see, but just about the fact of just every day putting yourself out there and maybe what you've learned from, from that. Sure. Well, I think um, getting rid of the idea that you have to be perfect helps a lot. Because I remember when I first started playing recitals in 2010, after not playing any since school in 2006, I would be very upset if I missed a note or something didn't go perfectly. And that is not the message of music. And I think after I threw that away and I just was more forgiving with myself, then I was really able to be more relaxed on stage and make great music. And so I think that's one of the most important things is letting go of perfection. And um, also getting the experience of being on stage is really important. I mean, I wasn't comfortable with doing a solo recital until I did about 20 in one year. And then you just build on each experience and you become more confident the more that you do it. So my first recitals, I did not get paid for. I wanted to build the experience and the endurance. So I went to various schools and I asked if I could play for free. And so I built my experience in a very safe way. And then once I felt very, very confident that I could deliver a high quality product to presenters, that's when I felt comfortable booking the work that actually pays. And the same thing with the brass quintet. The more shows we do, the better we get as a group, and the more endurance everybody gets, and the more comfortable people get on stage. I remember my first concert with Chrysalis back in 2010. I remember I was reading notes off a paper. 
Now I would never consider reading notes off of a paper. You need to talk to the audience like, you're, like you know them, you have a conversation with them and really connect with them. And so connecting with your audience is so important and also helps you feel more relaxed on stage. If you, can, if you feel really connected with your audience, that also releases some tension from your body and you can feel more comfortable making music. Okay. And do you feel that the, the social media and, and having that connection with your fans helps with that as well? Yes, definitely. We played, we just finished a tour last week and one of the towns we played in was Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. And this kind of ties in with the Indiegogo campaign. When I was raising $25,000, for Serif Brass's recording project and commissions, I started offering a deal on my Facebook fan page that if you gave just $25 or more, you would get a free lesson with me. And so I had a few people take me up on that offer, and one of them was a little girl who's in sixth grade from Pennsylvania. And so we had some scheduling conflicts to do the Skype thing, but then her dad realized that I was going to be just 40 minutes from their house. So we waited until last week, and I taught her in person. I gave her the lesson in person. And she's such a talented little girl. She's so cute, and she's so motivated. And she can already play up to high D. And she's so motivated, and she just felt, I could tell that the lesson meant so much to her. And hearing then hearing the group live, it just was really like, that's why I really wanted Serif Brass to be an all-female group, because we want to be role models to, to you know, little girls who choose to play brass instruments because my role models were all male and that's fine, but just having it be normalized that women brass musicians are, are out there and performing, her eyes were just so lit up and it was just, you know, really re reminded me of like why serif brass can be something very special. So we touched, you, you were talking about role models and how important it is now that you're showing young female brass players that there are female brass players in the field and you mentioned that your role models, a lot of them were males, but who were your biggest influences? Uh, you mean as a kid or now? Maybe as a kid and, and now. That's a... Well, when I was young, I loved Sergei Nikaryakov, and I still love him. His playing is so beautiful, and he can play anything. And so he was someone that I listened to a lot as, as a young adult. And um, of course, my teachers, David Bilger, I just, his sound is, is always in my head. And um, Recent influences would be Jens Lindemann and Jose Sabaha. And these are just trumpet players, of course, and also Hokan Hardenberger, of course. I learned so much from him and his lessons. And a lot of the things that he taught me didn't really apply, in my, didn't make sense to me until after my injury. And then I really started to use some of the techniques that he uses after the injury. So all these teachers you can get so much knowledge from, but those, those are my, my biggest um, trumpet influences. And of course, seeing um, Alison Balsam and how easy she plays, I really feel like I identify a lot with her. And uh, she also motivated me to try to do what she's doing. And um, she's been a really, really big influence as well. She's, she's incredible. She's one of my favorite players. Um, and where do you sort of see the, maybe like, this is an open-ended question, but where do you see the future of classical music and performance in the 21st century? We have so much technology around us, which is good. You have so much stuff on YouTube and Instagram and all of this, but where, where do you see the... I really have no idea. Okay. <laughs> but I can offer a couple of thoughts, I guess. Um, I think that connecting with young people is really important, and I would love to see more education in schools at an early age focusing on classical music and making it more part of the education in the schools, and I think that's how it will most likely live on, is if we can build an audience starting at an early age that wants to hear these concerts. And I think that's that's where it starts. And so with Serif Brass, we're applying to be a nonprofit right now, and I would love to raise money that we can so we can go into more schools and really work with students on a long-term basis. That is really important building the audiences of tomorrow, even mm -hmm. if they don't yes. play, but just the appreciation. Um, and some more fun questions now. So if you weren't a trumpet player, what would you do? Well, some people have told me recently that if I was ever injured again or couldn't play, that I should become an artist manager, which sounds crazy because they have a very stressful job. And I do work as that in a way for myself and for Seraph. 
So I, I could see myself really advocating for artists and booking work. I think that would be a fun challenge. Um, outside of arts, I think I would maybe want to do something in medicine. I mean, it's too late to, I would never switch to that now. Yeah. But if I went back in time and had to do something non-musical, I think I would definitely do something in medicine. Okay. And uh, what are your hobbies outside of trumpet and music? Well, uh, my husband is also a professional trumpet player, David Dash. He's the professor of trumpet at the North Carolina School of the Arts, and he's had a really great career. And so we're both professional trumpet players, and so our life really does revolve around the trumpet. But it's great because when we travel, we understand that we need to play every day and practice. And so that works out really well. But outside of that, I really, really love traveling. And that goes hand in hand with music because I often use, if I, if I travel overseas somewhere for something musical, I will often bookend that with a trip somewhere else that's just, you know, just to see the world. I recently played a concerto in Montana and I bookended the trip to go visit Glacier National Park and did hiking for four days. And so I really love nature and I love seeing the world. I want to, I want to travel to as many places as possible. That's something that's really, really important to me. Besides that, uh, I read and uh, hang out with Dave and our cat, Duke. We take our cat on walks with his leash. And, um, <laughs> you can watch it on Instagram. Yes, you can. <laughs> um, and uh, um, going back to our competition, um, it's going to be slightly different than a normal competition because everything's going to be through videotape. But... What will you be looking for um, when you watch somebody's video, um, or watching and listening? I will be listening for someone who makes a really great sound, who produces a really nice, easy sound on the trumpet, but um, someone who also really commits to the musical phrases and makes the most out of the music as possible. I want to not think of that person as a trumpet player, but I want to get lost in the story that they're telling. And uh, I also wanted to touch on, you, you briefly mentioned earlier about the importance of maybe when you recorded back in 2010 and 11 when the, maybe the technology wasn't as good, about having a good quality tape. Um, That's really important. Um, make sure that you don't record in the smallest room possible. Find something that isn't too boomy, but something that makes you sound natural and uh, avoid carpeted rooms that have carpet on every wall and that can go a long way um, just recording in a room where the trumpet sounds nice that's the first step so make sure that you find a good room make sure that you have some good recording equipment you can even do it on a zoom recorder if you know how to do the settings on that if you have a school that has more advanced uh, technology you can get someone there to help you so really take advantage of the resources that you have at your school that would be my best advice to people that are in college who are applying, take advantage of those resources. Take advantage of the recording engineer and ask advice for people that have done tapes before to make sure that the microphone isn't right in front of your bell, but find out where the mic placement sounds the best. And you can really learn a lot from this experience because if you learn how to record yourself with this competition, then you can make tapes for summer music festivals that sound better and other competitions because you have to make tapes for so many things now. Every summer festival, you have to make a tape, a pre-screening tape a lot of the times. Grad school, you have to make a pre-screening tape. So learn how to make a great tape now, and that will save you a lot of time later. If you can learn how to do those skills now, then you can make your own videos. You can sync it up with your iPhones, have such a clear picture now that you can, if you know how to use your Zoom recorder or whatever technology you're using to record, you can sync that up with your iPhone video and then have a pretty decent video to share on YouTube. Wonderful. Um, and do you have any advice if there's somebody maybe young who's watching now who wants to have your career? Uh, what would your advice be to, to them? <sighs> Work very, very hard for a, and be prepared to do that for a long time. Be relentless and most of all be very, very curious. Okay. And I also had one more question is you, you do a lot of traveling and we've talked a lot about the amount of work that you, that you do. Um, how do you take care of yourself to stay and, you know, to keep yourself going and in good shape? Well, if you were to ask 
the ladies of Serif Brass. Right now there's a photo collage being made from this past year that I have not seen yet of me taking very, very quick naps in random places. I am the, prof I am the professional napper. I, love, I, may, I have to get my sleep in, so sometimes I do 20 minute power naps and I will just lay on the ground and go to sleep. I can fall asleep anywhere. It's a rare talent, I know, but if I'm tired, I just need to sit on, I just need to lay on the ground and, and go to sleep. So that's probably the, the best way that I can make it through a day. Like if I'm super tired, I need to go to sleep for 20 minutes and that's what works for me. And then I wake up and I'm ready to go. And one other question I had as, as a trumpet player, when you're in all of these different hotels and staying at all these different places, how do you find the place to practice or do you have a mute or how do you go about that? I have to say, when I first started, I was very self-conscious about the sound of the trumpet, so I would always play with a mute and be really scared. Now, I don't play with a mute. I just play, but I make sure it's not too early. I make sure that it's not late at night. So, you know, if you're at the hotel, just make sure you're practicing at a reasonable time, and it'll probably be okay. I've only gotten a complaint once. You can also find a conference room. If it's warm out, you can play outside. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do, but I would avoid doing excessive practice with a mute because that won't make you feel super great. So if you can get somewhere where you can play open, just don't be afraid. Most people are not in the hotel during the day and you'll probably be fine without the mute. Okay. Um, and do you have like any human life advice for us or just general life advice? <laughs> General life advice, oh my. <laughs> I think just enjoying your life and doing what you wanna do is very important. You know, if you love music and you really can't see yourself doing anything else, then, then go for it. It can be a very difficult career, but if you love it, you can make it happen. If you work really hard and challenge yourself, always improve every day. So I think that you only live once, so take advantage of that. All right. Well, Mary, thank you so much for doing this. And thank I you. look forward to sharing all of the tapes with you um, and you sharing your comments with all of the participants. Great. And good luck to everybody who's sending a submission. I look forward to listening to everybody. Thank you.